My dear COR family, good morning. It is so wonderful to see all of you and to be in your midst and to worship the Lord together with you. You know, COR has been uh, for me particularly like a greenhouse. I came in here as a seedling. This was the cradle in which I was nurtured and then eventually I was sent out. Uh, and today I'm here with my wife, Faith. Uh, many of you would know her as Diana. She underwent a name change uh, at a very uh, uh, sort of a significant milestone in her life. And so she's here uh, with me this morning. You know, there was a time when uh, COR had just moved into this building from Malan Road. And the first six months, I was still here in COR before I got posted out to SJS. And I remember one day sitting in the office, and a phone call from a member of the public was directed to me. So I picked up the phone, and a lady said to me, uh, what kind of place is this, huh? So I said, this is a church. Church, huh? What, what is the name of the church? I said, Chapel of the Resurrection. She said, what? Chapel of the Right Direction? I thought to myself, that's not a bad name for a church. <laughs> but no, we are the Chapel of the Resurrection. Those are memories that come back, flooding back to me when I come to this place. Uh. And then also now recently after your renovation, something has changed in this sanctuary. I've been here before, but only recently, these, uh, the balcony here was opened up. I mean, before that, it was like kind of sealed off, right? So now it's opened up. You know that one of the most embarrassing moments in my entire life took place on that balcony so I must share with you. All right? So I was in secondary two. I was a student leader or kind of a prefect. And one of my fellow prefects, it was his job to give the command at the end of the school day. We call it Vesper, flag lowering ceremony. He will, uh, all the students will stand outside the class and he will shout, school attention, everyone come to attention. Then the national anthem will play, the, the piano come and everyone sing, then school pledge. Then the teacher beside will do a short devotion and then a closing prayer, and then he will say, school dismissed. That was his job. Day in, day out, he did it. One day, he said to me, Sham, I need your help. Lah. I got sore throat. I cannot shout. Can you take over from me? He said, I don't know how to do this. It's very simple. School attention, school dismissed. That's all. Okay? So, I, I, with trembling knees, I was standing there. Okay? And uh, I said, school attention. The next thing that I knew to expect was the music of the national anthem. But it never came. Then suddenly, I see the teacher who's standing on my right, she took the microphone and slid it in front of me. And then she looked at me and said, sing. Then she looked straight ahead. I looked at her in disbelief, but she was quite serious. So I looked straight ahead. The eyes of the whole school were now looking at me. I am the musical accompaniment now. So I began to sing the national anthem a cappella. And everyone sang along. Of course... I started in the wrong key. So by the time you got to the middle of the song, it was too high for anyone to sing. At the end of the whole fiasco, when I said, school dismissed, there was a roar of laughter that rose up from the whole school. They were stifling their laughter because they were under orders to be under attention. When I dismissed them, they all laughed at me. Well, that was a baptism of fire in terms of a public speaking ministry. But anyway... Today I want to talk about um, beware the leaven of the Pharisees in the context of uh, education weekend. And um, my three main points are these. Now, what did Jesus mean by the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod? And what is the warning to the 21st century church? And what are the implications for education mission? All right? So... Jesus and his disciples were on a boat. The disciples were aware of having forgotten to bring enough bread along. And Jesus, uh, having just concluded a disturbing conversation with the Pharisees, seemed to be lost in thought. And then he suddenly said to all the disciples in the boat, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, leaven is a familiar symbol. Leaven is uh, something that multiplies and spreads. Today, we don't talk about leaven so much, but we talk about virus and things going viral. And leaven can be used in a positive sense or in a negative sense. So just like viral, 
you can say that a good thing goes viral, meaning it begins to spread. But the moment you use the word virus, everyone knows you're talking about a bad thing, right? So leaven, likewise, could have a good connotation, a bad connotation. The fact that Jesus said the word beware the leaven, uh, clearly he was talking about it in a negative sense, right? And there was, so he was warning them there's something that is coming from the Pharisees and from Herod's throne that was spreading and multiplying among the community, among the wider community, and was even at risk of infecting that boat full of disciples. But um, Jesus was misunderstood by the disciples, which is a common theme in Mark's gospel. They assumed that he was talking about the fact that they hadn't brought bread along. After all, leaven is connected to bread, right? You put leaven. In fact, this morning uh, in the pre-service prayer, uh, uh, Reverend David highlighted the passage in which leaven is used as a symbol of the kingdom of God. Uh, but they misunderstood him, and then Jesus shows his uh, disappointment that they were on the wrong frequency entirely. And so he asked them these rhetorical questions. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? So these rhetorical questions not only express his disappointment, they also tell us what he's looking for in his disciples. He's looking for minds that can perceive and understand. He's looking for hearts that are soft and teachable. He's looking for eyes that can see, ears that can hear, and uh, memories that can recall. Then, like a wise senior doctor, tutoring junior doctors as they do their hospital rounds, he began to give them a lesson by asking them some leading questions. And he was bringing back to their remembrance two recent events, and he was asking them the question about numbers. So he says, When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Right? And they replied, 12. And then, the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full? And they said, seven. And then he said, do you not yet understand? Okay. So he is uh, using... He's asking leading questions to, to get them to observe some symptoms of a problem and to make the correct diagnosis and to, to compare the two events and observe the trending of the numbers. So, uh, let me try to use a mathematical expression to convey what I think Jesus was getting at. Now, my disclaimer is this may not be totally kosher in the eyes of some theologians, uh, and some of you who have an aversion for numbers may switch off at this point. But the, the equation is at the top line, right? Starting number of loaves multiplied by faith level in the atmosphere gives rise to a certain number of people fed plus leftover baskets, okay? So, starting number of loaves, in the first case was five loaves. He, he, he ignored the fish, Five loaves of bread times a certain faith level, let's call it F1, right? Gives rise to 5,000 people being fed plus 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, if we were to keep faith level the same, right? If you now start with, let's say, a greater number of loaves than five, you start with seven loaves and you now have a smaller number of people to feed, what do you expect? should be the leftover number. Should it be bigger than 12 or smaller than 12? Much more than 12. Right, thank you, Reverend Tim. It should be much more than 12, but in fact, it was less than that. It went down, right? So what is that showing? It's showing that F1 is not constant. In fact, F1 is changing. I'm not talking about Formula 1. I'm talking about faith level number 1. It is changing. Is it changing upwards or downwards? It is changing downwards. In other words, I think Jesus was trying to get them to use logic to understand that there's something happening in the faith atmosphere, just from the trending of the numbers. So the scale of the miraculous reproduction of bread was diminishing, saying something about the climate of faith. 
And that was a symptom. The diagnosis was that something in terms of the attitude and mindset of the Pharisees and Herod was spreading. That was the leaven. The leaven represented the insidious creeping of the Pharisees and Herod's unbelief and hostility towards Jesus. Bear in mind, just before this boat ride, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and uh, they asked him for a sign. And what did Jesus respond? He sighed deeply in his spirit. He went, <sighs> now you know that if your spouse does that to you or your parent does that to you, you are in big trouble, right? Yeah. And that's what Jesus did. <sighs> Probably shook his head. Why does this generation ask for a sign? So, so the attitude of unbelief and hostility. This was something dangerous that was already at work. And even Jesus' own disciples needed to be on guard. It was having an effect on Jesus, on the scale of Jesus' miracles. Bear, bear in mind, now just a couple of chapters earlier, Mark chapter 6, we are told that when he went to his hometown of Nazareth, Okay? He could not do many miracles of healing there because of their unbelief. So the, the, the faith level has an impact on the sort of magnitude of the power that is unleashed. So in time to come, as the story unfolds, this warning to the disciples proved to be a legit warning as one of the twelve themselves is infected with unbelief and hostility. You know who? Who? Judas Iscariot. And he ultimately joined the Pharisees and Herod and handed Jesus over to be crucified. So let me come now to my um, second heading, which is, what does this mean for the 21st century church? Is this warning still relevant to us? Well, I want to say the warning is still relevant because although we don't have Pharisees today and we don't have Herod today, that same unbelief has morphed and evolved and it is coming at us from a different angle. It's coming at us through the media, my friends. The world society, especially the first world society, is heavily leavened through the media. The media, especially social media, is leavening the entire society with attitudes and mindsets of unbelief and cynicism and hostility towards Jesus. And it's not just in trace amounts, like you only need a trace amount of leaven to leaven the bread, right? Now we are literally swimming in this leaven. It is everywhere. It's all around us. And the attitudes, what are the attitudes that are spreading through the media? and uh, social media, slide seven. Okay. What are the mindsets that are coming at us? Let me give you a few examples, right? Tip of the iceberg, rejection of authority. Rejection of traditional binary categories like male and female. Dismantling of institutions like marriage promiscuity, toxic masculinity, and toxic feminism. LGBTQ, and even the blatant worship of the devil. All these are coming at us through the media. We are being bombarded by the contagious attitudes through the news media, through funny videos, through political videos, through TikTok, through Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, etc. By the way, recently Elon Musk uh, and Twitter have been in the news a lot, haven't they? Right? I wonder whether the day will come where he will try to buy over Facebook and YouTube as well. Then he can put all three together in a hybrid company and call it You Twit Face. I believe this leaven through the media is why miracles seem to be seen far less in Singapore and in other technology-saturated societies of the world compared to the third world countries or the poorer regions. 
I believe this is also why evangelism is getting harder and harder. It's always been difficult, but it's now seemingly getting more difficult and even more difficult among the young. I also believe that this is the reason why many Gen Y, Gen Z uh, young people are leaving the church and becoming hostile to Christianity. I don't think it's too difficult to see where the influence is coming from. Uh, Sister Jemima Ui, some of you may know of her, she's a Singaporean missionary to Congo, and uh, she shares this insightful observation in uh, Salt and Light. And I quote, I think there's a difference between first century Christianity and first world Christianity. In first century Christianity, all the disciples, about, apart from John, were martyred. And they were in it for what they could give. But sometimes in our first world Christianity, we are in it for what we can get. End quote. So, my friends, are we fighting a losing battle? Is it pointless to expect our children and youth to be faithful to God? Is it pointless to aspire for a healthy, non-dysfunctional family life? Is it pointless to evangelize anymore? Is it pointless to try and live a life that pleases God? Might we as, just as well give up? You know, in, uh, in circuses, they travel with animals, right? Because they use these animals. And it has been noted that sometimes an, an elephant can be confined to a certain area just by tying it to a single pole that is uh, stuck in the ground. Okay? And though this huge ele animal can easily yank the, the pole out and run off, it doesn't. And the reason why is because from the time it is a baby, right, it was tied to that pole. And in its early years, it tries to tug against that pole and the pole is too strong. So it gives up and it learns that this pole uh, has already defeated it. And so even though over the years it gets bigger and bigger, it will continue to walk in the circle that is demarcated by the limit of the rope around that pole, the radius uh, of the rope around that pole. It will not challenge that pole because it has learned to be defeated by it. This is called a learned helplessness. You see the same thing in puppies. When they try to jump a fence and that fence is too high for them, they learn that the fence is too high. Even when they grow bigger and they are well able to take a leap and fly over the fence, they don't. Why? Learned helplessness. And I'm wondering whether there is a learned helplessness that is creeping into the church. A mindset impregnated with unbelief and despair. Our superpower as a church has never changed. And what is our superpower? Is it our discipline? Is it our cleverness? Is it our money? None of the above. Our superpower as a church is our ability to recognize that as bad as the situation around us may look, God can always do something to turn it around. Hallelujah. As bad as it may look, our God is on the throne and He is never defeated by anything and He can turn it around if we will only look to Him. As 1 John chapter 5, verse 4-5 to says, And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? of God. Friends, we need to pray for and believe in God's healing in the church, in the renewing of our minds so that our lives may be transformed. We need to repent of uncritically and unwisely imbibing the attitudes and mindsets of the world, old and young included, the leaven that is flooding our media-saturated lives. And we need accountability and discipline to wean ourselves off the toxic content and place constraints on our own freedom to explore the jungle called the internet. Finally, let me come to implications quickly for education mission. And there are three. We need to impart right attitudes, we need to start young, and we need to make sacrifices. 
If the leaven or virus of unbelief is coming through social media, then the church must take the gospel to the young before social media gets to them. Chaplaincy in preschools and primary schools takes on heightened importance in view of the current situation. Our schools and preschools allow us a narrow window to deposit truth before cynicism and unbelief take hold. Remember, the reason we run schools as an Anglican church is not because we are the only ones who know how to teach people how to read and write. Rather, it is because we are among the few that teach and impart godly values and attitudes in addition to the basic education. And these values change habits and change worldviews and ultimately change destinies. We need more committed Christian teachers to be salt and light in our schools. This may be a sacrifice to those who may have ambitions for more lucrative careers, but I reckon I don't need to convince COR members about the importance of saving our children. And what may seem like a sacrifice from a secular point of view is truly a privilege and a joy when seen from a kingdom point of view. This weekend, the World Cup is starting, right? And people are paying big money to get front row seats to watch people like Lionel Messi or Harry Kane in action, okay? But I tell you that those of us who step forward to serve God, we are given front row seats to watch God Almighty do incredible things in and through us. Front row seats that will boggle your mind. And so no price is too great a price to pay for that. COR has had a strong legacy of being involved in education mission from day one. In fact, four of your vicars have been chairman of the education board, right? Starting with Canon James Wong, then Canon John Benson, and Reverend Daniel Tong, and now Reverend David Lee. And so, COR, I want to encourage you to support and encourage your vicar in his role as a chairman of the education board and to own the work that he is doing on your behalf. Finally, let me conclude. Jesus warns his disciples and he warns us, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, meaning beware the attitudes of unbelief and hostility that are coming through the media. Don't let it defile your heart. And uh, rather, let it spur you to step up sacrificial efforts in caring for the young in COR. And it's so, I don't think it's a coincidence that the children's camp is going on right now and the youth camp is just coming up. These are vitally important occasions which you must pump uh, your full backing into. Yeah. Now, many years ago, when I was in COR, we were involved in chaplaincy ministry to the SAJC and I was part, uh, assigned like a school counsellor and an associate chaplain. And, uh, and there was a sense of frustration that was building up. The frustration that there seemed to be so much potential but so little fruit. Why weren't we making the kind of impact that we, we sensed the Lord wanted, to make, wanted us to make? So we sat down and analyzed the, the, the problems. What are the blockages? We began and the Lord began to move in our hearts to come up with a new approach. And we called it the mentor program. Right? And in this approach, uh, between Pastor Chishen and myself, it was kind of developed. Right? We, we, instead of older adults mingling with the students, we wanted uh, adults who were just slightly older, you know, just two, three, four years older than the students to engage with them. And instead of formal relationships, right, we wanted uh, to have informal relationships where they were like friends, buddies. Uh, they chit-chat in the cafeteria. They, they play together during PE. They, they kind of like uh, just connect over uh, whatever... Uh, text messages or, or whatever, and, uh, and, and build up that relationship that way. And through the establishment of these relationships, we, ex we impact lives through example, care, and witness. And so I remember uh, sharing this with Canon Wong, and then Canon said, present this to the PCC. And, uh, and I, I presented it to the PCC, and I was amazed. The PCC immediately backed it up and set aside a huge budget to support this work and kicked it off straight away. And that is a credit to the COR PCC for backing up this chaplaincy work, and it has continued until today. Can you please uh, give a hand of encouragement to the PCC members? 
So later on, you're going to get to watch a video in which uh, several of the people involved in the mentor program have been uh, interviewed. I hope it continues to be an avenue where CORs, young people, see it almost as a rite of passage after completing their tertiary studies that they come and serve one or two years in the mentor program. And parents, those of you who are parents of young people, please support your children in taking this one year or two years to serve the Lord. See the bigger picture. Don't just count the dollars and cents. And now, uh, I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer. Please join me, and then worship team, we can prepare the response song. Lord, we want to uh, thank you for your word, and we want to thank you for this special day that we can be in your presence. Lord, speak to us in our hearts. Let the warning that you sounded to the disciples in that boat ring across, through, across the centuries and across space and time to capture our hearts, that we are mindful and wary of the leaven that is coming at us through the media today. Help us, Lord, to keep our hearts dedicated to you and pure. And Lord, help us to uh, invoke our superpower, which is our faith and trust in an almighty God to do exceedingly more than all that we can ask or imagine. And instead, Lord, let us be agents of your kingdom leaven, the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let our attitude of trust in this good leaven, the counter leaven of the kingdom, Lord, uh, propel us forward into the Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless.